Okay, my first question for you is, how do you decide which medications to start for hypotension or for low blood pressure? Okay, all right, that's a pretty good one. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Ford, the Nikki Doc. Welcome to my channel. I'm super excited because today, I get to ask Dr. Tala from Tala Talks NICU the questions that you have submitted for us. Going back and forth, answering a few questions that you've asked us in the past. We hope you enjoy it. So I can't wait to hear what her answers are. Let's get straight to it. So Dr. Tala, what are your feelings about residuals? What do you do with them? How do you manage them? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. This is a tough one, Prem. So we've all seen the literature that shows that residuals don't really predict whether a baby is going to get neck or not. And we also know that when we take residuals really seriously, so for example, we're measuring every single residual and it makes us, it makes us slow down the feeds or sometimes we stop the feeds altogether because a baby has a residual. We know that that's really bad as well. It will stop the baby's nutrition, it will affect the baby's growth and therefore affect the baby's development. But I will say I've also worked in units where we've tried really hard to stop everybody from checking residuals. And I think that's really hard to get people to do. And I'm kind of guessing here because I don't work at the bedside, but I think one of the reasons is, is that a lot of people have been checking residuals throughout their entire career. And so it's kind of difficult making such a big clinical change. The second reason, and I think this is how I would feel if I worked at the bedside, is that basically it's one more piece of the pie. So if my baby at bedside had abdominal distension or was spitting up a little bit more, I probably would want to see whether the baby had residuals just to see if something really was going on or the baby had just kind of swallowed a bunch of gas and that's why we had abdominal distension. So I think it's really difficult to say that residuals are completely irrelevant. I will, however, give a few caveats. If a baby is on trophic feed, so getting less than like 20 to 25 mLs per kilo, then I'll pretty much ignore residuals. It takes time for the gut to get moving and we're gonna have a couple of mLs of milk in there. I think the times that I really do care about residuals are obviously if they're associated with any change in the clinical exam. So like we said, bad abdominal distension or something, or if the residual is suddenly way, way bigger than it's ever been. So babies seem to be tolerating feeds fine and then suddenly we've got the full feed still sitting there in the belly, or if the residuals suddenly go green. Okay, my first question for you is, how do you decide which medications to start for hypotension or for low blood pressure? Okay, all right, that's a pretty good one. Now, I love talking about vasopressors. It's one of my favorite topics. So let's get straight to it. When you have hypertension, you're trying to decide which vasopressor to use. It really has to do with understanding the type of receptors. You, you can use dopamine, epinephrine, you can use dobutamine, you can use vasopressin. Dopamine essentially acts on three receptors, your dopamine receptor, your beta receptor, and your alpha receptor. Dopamine receptor works on the kidney, basically flushes it out. We call this ultrafiltration. So this is why it's gentle to the kidney. That's sort of low dose dopamine. When we get to middle dose dopamine, now we're talking about using your beta receptors, specifically beta-1. See, beta-1 is at the heart, and it really helps with contra contractility. It is an inotrope, and it also accelerates the heart, makes it beat faster, which is a chronotrope. So it really acts in those two things to get the heart pumping and better cardiac output. When you get to higher dose dopamine, you're now dealing with your alpha receptor. Your alpha is the one that causes vasoconstriction. It's in the periphery. And so you're able to squeeze a little more and that way you get your blood pressure to come up. Now, epinephrine is very similar. Epinephrine actually acts on your alphas and your betas as well. The difference with epinephrine is that it's not a scaling up on different receptors. Essentially, you're acting on your alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two receptors all together which means when you do epinephrine, you're not only squeezing the periphery to try and get the blood pressure up, but you're also making that heart pump a little bit stronger and faster. So you've got two actions that are going on at the same time. By the way, a nice thing too, to know too, is that you know about the EpiPen, right? Well, when you have an, an asthma attack, you're using your beta-2 receptor with epinephrine. Beta-2 is in your bronchioles, which means they open up and that way you can get good, good airflow in there. Okay, what about vasopressin? So vasopressin works on your vasopressin receptor, and this is in the periphery. 
It acts essentially like your alpha ones we talked about. So what that means is that vasopressin actually helps to squeeze the blood vessels. One issue with that is that vasopressin is also called DDAVP. What it means is that it actually works in the kidney to hold on to water. This is why you have to be careful with vasopressin because you can cause some hyponatremia, your sodium drops down. Finally, dobutamine. Dobutamine actually just works on your beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, specifically beta-1s. So we're talking about the heart receptor, right? Which means it helps you really squeeze. If you have a kid who has uh, hypotension that we think is heart related, the function is not great, you might want to use your dobutamine because you'll be able to help that baby get be better cardiac output without causing an increased afterload, without making it more difficult to be able to squeeze that uh, and get that flow out of, the, out of the heart by squeezing your periphery, which are your alpha ones. When you're trying to decide which vasopressor should I use, Try and think about what's the physiology and which receptor do I want to go ahead and attack with these. How do you choose when it is time to extubate babies, especially those tiny ones? And when you do extubate, what sort of settings do you use on the non-invasive support? Yeah, choosing to extubate, that's a really great question because it's a little bit of an art to a certain degree. You can actually try and look up certain criteria to be able to extubate. There are some studies looking at extubation failure and using specific numbers uh, for extubation failure, which means that you extubated, the baby failed, and now therefore you have to re-intubate. And you can kind of extrapolate that data to be able to decide when to extubate. The reality is the longer we stay intubated, there are studies showing that the greater lung damage it causes because we're using positive pressure. We're essentially punching those alveoli every time we give a breath on the machine. So you want to take that breathing tube out as soon as possible. If you can avoid having a breathing tube, even better. But if you have a breathing tube in, the earlier, the better to try and get out. But it's always really tricky to balance what are the baby's vital signs? How is the baby doing? And is it better to go ahead and extubate? The reality is it's essentially a little bit of a trial and error. When you think that the baby's vital signs are stable, regardless of gestational age, regardless of actual weight, you can actually decide if I'm on low enough settings to go ahead and take the breathing tube out, knowing that we may fail. It's possible with those extremely low birth weight infants that a great percentage of them will fail. However, if we say 20% of those will not need a breathing tube, again, you have decreased the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia in those 20% babies. It makes a big difference in mortality and morbidity. So you sort of use a little bit of your risk benefit ratio to decide what to do. If you're able to get settings, and most people will say, if you're able to get your you know, respiratory rates on your mechanical ventilator in the mid to low 20s, if you're able to use or have PIPs in the you know, mid teens to 20 at most, if you're able to have a PEEP uh, somewhere below sort of seven or eight. And by the way, some places we're talking about, there are different places of extremes, but roughly those numbers gives you a good indication you're probably good enough to be able to extubate. Some programs will actually do a pressure support trial. What that means is that you're taking the whole SIMV and AC and other types of mode, and you put them on pressure supported ventilation. What that means is the baby is doing the job but the machine is giving extra pressure because essentially you're breathing with an ET tube through a straw. So it helps with breathing through the straw, but it gives you an idea, does the baby actually tolerate being on those pressures and breathing on its own? There's not good studies supporting this, but some people will do that to be able to bridge them to make a decision whether to extubate or not. The reality is always try and extubate as soon as possible if you feel that the baby is clinically well and stable to do so with the knowledge, again, that you may have to re-intubate and it depends on the expertise of your center whether you want to go ahead and take that risk of being able to extubate with the knowledge that you have to intubate or if you're not in an experienced center, you might want to hold off until the baby receives that experience in a level four. Okay, Tala, here's a tricky one now. When do you decide, the jet or the oscillator? For which type of patient? I mean, this question is literally half of neonatology. I think the overall very, very vague answer is to put the baby on the machine, which requires the lowest support. So the lowest 
mean airway pressure, the lowest volume, the lowest pressures, the lowest respiratory rate that can still provide the baby enough support to oxygenate and ventilate and make the baby as comfortable as possible. I will also say that the different types of machines we use are really very ventilator, are really very unit dependent. So for example, our unit does use the jet. A lot of units don't have jets, so they become extremely competent at using all the other different types of machines. So I'll kind of let you know what I do or what we pretty much do in, in our units. And that is the tiny, tiny baby. So 22, 23, 24 weekers will pretty much put them on the jet. And they're probably staying on the jet for, for some time, at least kind of a couple of weeks or so. The slightly older babies, kind of maybe 24, 25, 26 weekers, ho we're hoping that they're not going to be intubated for a long period of time. And normally we'll put them on the conventional vent. And that is a whole other topic when we talk about volume control and pressure control. I will use the oscillator when I'm really trying to take advantage of the ability to separate ventilation and oxygenation. So for example, in situations like meconium aspiration syndrome, in pulmonary hyperplasia, in just general PPHN, then that's pretty much when we're using the oscillator. The other super vague thing I want to add is that babies will really let you know what type of gas exchange they prefer. So for example, sometimes you have to put them on the conventional vent and then just change around loads of different settings until you can find exactly when that baby is breathing the easiest and kind of has the best gases and lowest FiO2 and stuff. The other thing is, is sometimes babies, as they get older or as their lung disease pr progresses, they preferred method of gas exchange actually changes. So we've all had those babies that have just been stuck on the oscillator for ages. We're trying to wean them. We're going nowhere fast. And then one day out of desperation, we just kind of put them on the conventional vent and suddenly they love it. We can't wean fast enough and they're doing a lot better. So we're not just thinking about the baby at one point in time. We also have to kind of think, how is the baby developing? Super vague answer. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> That's good. How do you deal with difficult emotional situations in the NICU? For example, with codes or with deaths? Yeah, wow, okay, that is a uh, charged question, but I think a really important one for us to address. So difficult situations and emotional situations are never easy. There's nothing that you do in training. You may be recorded a million times, you may be taught classes, it doesn't matter until you sit down and deal with a baby who is coding, with a baby who is dying or ha who has a lethal disease, it is very hard to know exactly what to say, how to say it, and by the way, to know how you're going to react until you're there. One of the things that I teach my trainees is essentially be open and honest. Uh, if you have some type of a bond with the family, use that. It's okay for you to get emotional. It's okay for you to feel down, sad. It's okay if you want to cry with the family. It, you have to get a feel for that and how much of that is sincere. Families really appreciate you when you're honest, sincere, uh, especially if you know, especially if you know the baby. Don't try and fill in the silence with nonsensical, you know, phrases or things, uh, you know, you never want to say we're going to a better place. Nothing like that. Silence is okay. You need to feel the room a little bit. And this is why it's so hard to teach. One tip that I can give you is getting that conversation started about either a very severe situation or a death. You want to prepare the family that you're going to be talking about something that's very serious and something that's probably not great news. You can do that by lowering your voice. You can position them well. You can have them sit down. Again, silence communicates a whole lot. Your body language communicates a whole lot. So as you walk in, you give them time to prepare themselves with the idea and the knowledge that you're going to start relaying some information, which is going to be very difficult to relate. And that leads to walking them through the process until you actually give that information. You know, we, your baby started having some signs of A, B, and C. We went ahead and did, you know, B, C, and D. And as we were doing that, we noted, you know, all these other things. And so you walk them until the point where you go ahead and give them the information. 
And then when you relay that really difficult information, it's okay to stay quiet. You need to give time for the family to absorb that information. If they're asking questions, you respond. This is not the time to give the information and then keep talking. You stop, you read the room, you respond if, respond if you need to, but this is the time for quiet introspection for the family, for them to really gather all their strength, the people around them, all the support. So this is really difficult and very hard to answer in a few minutes, but it is something that with time, you can really learn to be able to do this well with respect, with love, with honesty, and with transparency that you gave them the respect and the love that that baby deserved. And so it is a really difficult topic to talk about, but unfortunately in the ICU, we do deal with death. And so you really want to learn how to be compassionate about this. All right, everybody, thank you so much for those great questions you submitted. I'm going to continue to do this back and forth with uh, Dr. Tala. I appreciate her coming on to the channel to talk about these questions. Really, really good answers. And we'll hopefully be able to do this again. We're going to go ahead and ask you to submit questions either through YouTube to the channel or Instagram. You can follow me at the Nikki Doc and we'll be able to get those questions. We'll pick out a few and then we'll answer this on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time. As always, Dr. Ford signing out. We'll see you with the next video.